just before we started, uh, there's a whole bunch of old assignments and editions here in front. So make sure that you collect them if you are missing any of your assignments or editions. They're here. Um, after the final exam, I typically uh, trade this sort of stuff. So please make sure you pick it up. Uh, there's always a whole lot of stuff that's going to collect after the course. What about your most recent assignment? The most recent assignment, uh, Rita is still dating that, and she may be finished by Thursday or Friday, so if you're around, you're just going to pick it up from the office. Yeah. Just a bit of a delay with that final assignment day. Uh, the solutions are posted along the course website. So let's take a look then at um, where we come in this course and we can put it up a where everything is in perspective. Right? So that's often one of the hardest parts. Of we get into so much detail in the course that we lose sight of where we where we are. So we started off this course in chapter one in both versions of this course, so and we looked at a whole bunch of definitions. In many cases, in many aspects, I should say, chapter one is the most important part of this course. It covers the definition of uh, reaction rate. So where we have moles per unit of time, per unit volume. That was an intensive property. It doesn't matter what type of reactor we use, how big the reactor is, how small the reactor is, the reaction rate is always this similar. It will always hold no matter what configuration. That's a phenomenally important aspect uh, that people don't always appreciate. I feel that the reaction will proceed differently if it happens in a batch reaction. Well, that's not true. The reaction rate is an intensive property. It does not depend on the size of the system nor the configuration. The next major section that you derive in chapter one is the mole balance. So this was really the fundamental basis for everything we looked at in this course. Recall the mole balance looked something like the number of moles changing for species J over time was equal to the number of moles flowing into our boundary minus the number of moles moving, plus then how we change those moles over time. And that was given in the most general form by integrating over the volume of the reaction rate by the V. Okay, so only if it's well mixed can this simplify. So if well mixed, that simplifies to Rj times V. Okay, but if it's not, we have to leave that integral in that form and deal with it. Okay, so for all the ideal reactors we dealt with in this course, that assumption did hold, so we could simplify it up like that. So that meant then that for batch reactors, we could simplify that equation. And for batch reactor, then we derive ENK by the T is equal to RJ times T. Okay, so for batch reactor, notice that those flow terms in and out drop off because by definition we do not have those occurring during the batch. <coughs> the batch system is closed, the volume is constant, the assume is well mixed, so that mass balance or certain mole balance of it simplifies to that uh, simple form. And that's just a differential equation. So it's an only thing that we can integrate either analytically if it's simple enough or numerically if it's more complex, depending on the large agents. We looked at CSTRs then, and we derived all the assumptions related to CSTRs. So recall CSTR again, well mixed, and that the, bulk, that the material leaving the reactor is um, same as the contents inside the reactor. That's a critical assumption, but right? we brought that into reflection uh, most recently in the last class where we recognized that that's not always true. So the CSTR assumption is a very, very strong assumption of well mixed and then the material inside the reactor is what's leaving and if that holds that mole balance then simplifies down to the algebraic equation. So the volume is equal to the F, the flow, mole flow entering minus the mole flow leaving divided by the negative R and J. So let's just note here we're starting to see some Things that we should be very comfortable with, we've got positive Rj and negative Rj. So positive Rj is the rate of formation. This is something that we're comfortable with, and the negative is the rate of disappearance or depletion. 
Okay, so always make sure that the signs are consistent and mean, are, are meaningful to you. Uh, for example, you would be quite concerned that if you solve this equation up here for CSTR and you've got a negative volume, right? It's, it's indicating that you, you flip something with your sign in the graph that you probably didn't intend to have. So make sure that that understanding of formation and disappearance is something that you're very comfortable with. Um, so that's an that's a algebraic equation. And then the final two types of reactors we looked at were the reactors and type of reactors. So let's just do a, a PFR first. That is a DFJ by DV. It's given as RJ. Or a packed bed reactor, same equation in structure, but now our reference is obviously not the volume. We're more concerned with the catalyst. So DFJ DW with kilograms of catalyst is equal to what we call RJ dash. Okay, or we could write that simply as the regular rate of reaction divided by the catalyst density. So chapter one we spent about four or five classes on because it forms such a fundamental basis for this course. Let's take a look then at what um, we then we go to chapter two after a few classes. And the purpose of chapter two then, again in both textbooks, this is consistent in uh, so chapter two, we say, well, the equations over here that we derive, these four equations for the four types of reactors. This is the most general form. The rest, chapters two, three, four, five, and six in the book, really take them and, and then specialize them and look at different aspects of, of the reactor. And chapter two said, well, let's specialize and look at it in terms of conversion. So let's look at it in terms of conversion x, where we call x is simply the number of moles in minus what's leaving divided what's entering. So that's for that. And for flow systems, conversion is quite similarly as Fa mod minus Fa over Fa mod. Okay, so for CSTRs or flow flow reactors, conversion is defined by an actual. So what we ended up doing in chapter two, the whole purpose of chapter two was to, to follow a procedure where we specify the reaction rate as a function of conversion. So rather than specify reaction rate as a function of concentration, which is the most usual form, we spent some time in chapter two looking at re-expressing that in terms of conversion. Because then what we can do is we can take my mole balance, and write that in terms of conversion. Okay, so now, another, we introduce this concept of the design equation. The design equation is nothing more than the mole balance. Okay, so the design equation is nothing more than the mole balance for a particular reactor. So what we did is, in chapter two, we did those, those two steps. We, we re-expressed our rate in terms of conversion, and we re-expressed our mole balance in terms of conversion. So what happened then uh, for a batch reaction, we integrated this expression over here, and we got it written in terms of conversion as follows. We said, well, for a batch reactor, my key criteria is time, so Na0 is dx by dt now, so if I re-express it in terms of conversion times minus RAB, or I can write that as time to run the batch is equal to Na0 over B, and then we integrate from 0 to x dx over minus RA. So either one of these, you could either use the differential form over here, or you could use this integral form. They're all equivalent to each other depending on what your objective is. Okay, so notice all we've done is we've converted that mole balance over into conversion. 
Same for the CSTR. Here's the equation for CSTR, written in terms of minus Rj and flows. Well, what we did then is we re-expressed that in terms of conversion. So that looked like V is equal to Fa0 over minus Ra times conversion x. Okay, where minus Ra was written in terms of conversion. So I'll emphasize it by writing minus Ra x here. The plug flow reactor, we did exactly the same again. We wrote that ODE in terms of conversion and we integrated it here. And so that looks like V, the volume required for a plug flow reactor is the integral from zero to X, the conversion, times FA naught over minus RA dx. And then for a pack bed reactor, similar idea. This time though, we're not integrating the volume, we're integrating the catalyst weight. And that's the integral from zero to x of Fa naught over Ra divided by rho B. Or another way we could actually write it, and I'll just keep consistent with the textbook, is write Ra dash x. Okay, so just make a note here that, that we can convert from Ra to Ra dash by simply dividing through by the campus density. Okay, so chapter two was nothing more than taking what we learned in chapter one and repeating it, but changing our frame of reference over to conversion. And the only reason why we did that is we get a bit more experience with those design equations, that was one reason, but then the other reason is for many systems of practical use, there is only one reaction occurring, and then it's easy to work in terms of conversion. So, make a note here then, when we're working in terms of conversion, so use conversion only when there's one reaction. Okay, so if we've got multiple reactions, there's, there's no point when we cannot in fact work in terms of conversion. Is that negative RA dash for the path reactor? Yes. So when you're studying, please go through the textbook as well. Don't just rely on my notes over there. Sometimes this happens. Or sometimes you write from the board and this negative and positive signs. So, so let's take a look at chapter one is the most general. Chapter two, then we go and we write our expressions that we learned in chapter one in terms of conversion. So that serves that purpose. It serves another purpose as well. It, it helps understand this concept of integrating the area under a curve. So recall that we would plot conversion on my x-axis, and then I would plot Fa0 over minus Ra on my y-axis. And for the first order system, for example, we could have maybe based on experimental data or due to theoretical knowledge, we can get that curve. It's how conversion, and it's changing, what the corresponding flows and rates are on the y-axis. And what we notice then is that for CSTRs, this term over here <coughs> is the product of flow over RA. That term over there, that's what's on my y-axis. And this term over here is what's on my x-axis. So the product of those is a rectangle on my plot. So on this plot, I can then go draw a rectangle that says for a given conversion x, that rectangle and the area enclosed in the rectangle is equal to the volume for the CSTR. at a conversion of x, let's call it x subscript c. So if I require that sort of conversion, I know that I need to be operating at that point with that reaction rate and that enclosed area under the rectangle gives me my reactor volume. 
we can check that, right? I mean, we should always check our units here. The units of Fa0 is moles per second. The units of Ra is moles per meter cubed second. So that cancels, leaving meters cubed as my y variable units. The x-axis has no units. So area is the product of those two, it's meters cubed, and so the area under any part of that curve will give you um, meters cubed. Um, in your equation for the CSVR, you have the RA x, that just means... RA is a function of x. So we would write that, for example, as minus RA is equal to K, CA, and then you write CA in terms of conversion. The other part that we noticed here is that um, in this expression for the integrals, we've got, we're integrating FA0 over minus RA with respect to dx. So for a PFR, the area under the curve now, let's say if we desire a particular conversion, let's call that XP, that area under the curve corresponds to the volume required for a PFR. Okay, so that, that's interesting that both of these design equations have FA0 over RA, FA0 over RA, and so when we plot that on the y-axis with conversion on the x, we can use those integrated areas to get reactive volumes. So uh, if you see that, come across this in the future, it's, uh, you'll see these called Levenspiel plots. Okay, so it's named after Octave Levenspiel, a famous professor who, who came up with this design procedure. And then finally, we noticed in this chapter that we could look at reactors in series. So I could have a plug flow reactor followed, say, by a CSTR, or a plug flow followed by a plug flow followed by a CSTR, or just simply multiple CSTRs in series. And they can be calculated in size using one, one plot. Okay, so chapter two then really introduced that topic to us. Then we moved on to chapter three, which is really just a recap of chemistry. So again, in both, in both versions of the textbook, chapter three introduced a number of concepts <coughs> to us. Chapter three was on rate laws. And some of the important issues here was the idea of elementary reactions non-elementary reactions. The idea that K, the rate constant, is actually not constant, but is a function of temperature. So for example, K is equal to the activation energy divided by P over RT. Sorry, the pre-exponential factor multiplied by the uh, rate to the exponent of the activation energy over RT. So that also means that if you know the rate constant at one temperature, you can find it at another temperature by taking the ratio of that equation. So we looked at that in the, in the course notes. The other important concept that we learned in chapter three was the idea of reversibility. So we said that if we consider A plus B goes to C plus D, but in a reversible manner, we introduced the concept of an equilibrium constant, Kc which is then the final concentration at equilibrium of the products divided by the concentrations of the species, uh, the reactants, and then these are raised to the respective powers. Okay. Is that always true, or is that only the only the reactants that this to the powers? Oh, oh, sorry, wait a second. These are not here. It's always true. This equation is always true. Are they ever to this one? Yes, I think, I think they are. They are, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I don't right. know if that's only for elementary No, no, you're right. Sorry, and I'm, the reason why I'm confused is I'm looking for the down here. So C, D, A, B. Uh, this is always true. This is always true, and it's also always true that this is equal to the rate constant forward 
divided by the rate constant because. So Kc, that C subscript refers to the fact that we're dealing with concentrations over here. And then it's also equal to the reaction rate ratio. So that's by definition. The other uh, point is that if you calculate the net reaction rate, so let's just put it one species, the net reaction rate is the sum of the forward reaction rate plus the reverse reaction rate. Okay, so the forward reaction rate we calculate going A plus B goes to C plus D, the reverse reaction rate is C plus D goes back to A and B. We can sum those two and get the net reaction rate. And then the other definition of equilibrium implies that RA net is equal to zero. So no reaction <coughs> is taking place at equilibrium. The forward and the reverse reactions are equal to each other. So chapter three was that, uh, that concept from a, a chemistry recap. Chapter four then was introducing stoichiometry and particularly we were starting to look at a system that expands and contracts in gas space. So if you're looking this up in the textbook, this is chapter four in the new version of Folger. And then this is where they start to deviate and still in chapter three the old version. Now, there's some confusion here on, on this for, for some of you. The reality is there's really only one equation you should re remember here. And that is that Cj, the concentration, is always equal to the flow of the species divided by the volumetric flow. Okay, and then that simplifies in certain cases. The most general form of that is Ct0, so the total concentration multiplied by Fj divided by Ft, the total flow multiplied by the pressure ratio multiplied by the temperature ratio T0 over T. This always holds. Okay, what we then did is we said, well, let's go back to this idea of trying to go back to conversion. So notice here, this is expressing concentration in terms of all other variables which are easy to measure and unknown, pressures, temperatures, flows. But sometimes, particularly for single reaction systems, it might be convenient to work in terms of conversion. And so we introduced this stoichiometric table that said, well, that's CA0 times theta j plus uj times x, the conversion. Then we had this expansion factor, 1 plus epsilon x in the denominator, multiplied by p over p naught, multiplied by t naught over t. So the moment you see conversion, that's telling you you're back to single reaction systems. Whereas this former equation here will always hold in multiple reaction and indeed for single reaction systems. So there's really no need to use this simplification down here in terms of conversion unless you have to be working in terms of, of conversion. Okay, so let's just uh, quickly, uh, there's one, one term I want to draw your attention to is this UJ. For example, if we're dealing with this uh, system of A and B goes to C plus D, for example, that would be U B would be D over A. Or if we're dealing with species C, one of the, uh, the products is plus C over A. So for reactants, it's the negative coefficient divided by A, and for products, it's the positive coefficient divided by A. And then epsilon, if you recall, is the mole fraction of A at the entry times delta. And delta tells me how much the system expands and contracts. So again, here my, my key point is always use the general form where possible, use the, these um, 
use conversions when you really need to. Well, one other term that should be defined here, in, in case you've forgotten, is the theta j term. So theta j is the flow of species j at the entrance divided by the flow of a naught.
So if we go back to chapter 6 then, well, this is also in the old textbook, it's part of chapter 4. We said, let's go back to our mole balances. And so for example, for the PFR, that was DFJ by the D is equal to RA. And what we did is we also recognized that sometimes this, this rate <coughs> is not just affected by reaction, but there might also be some of the species leaving the reactor through diffusion. So that's really the only incremental piece of work that we uh, did back in chapter 6. And the reason why we had to go back to our mole balance instead of using conversion is because we're not able to handle the, this diffusion case if we're working only in terms of top conversion. Now for those of you reviewing chapter 6, you will see a section on semi-batch reactors. So please omit that. We did not cover that in this course. in the old textbook, it also appears there. So either, either version, uh, ignore the, the sections on the same batch we do not cover it. So, and then uh, some good news regarding chapter 7. So chapter 7 is the chapter on rate data calculations. So we look there at the integral and the differential method. Okay, I believe it's chapter 6 or chapter 5. I don't actually have written down. The good news here is I uh, omit this for the exam. And the reason is because this chapter really requires substantial amounts of computer-based work, um, so there's no sense in, uh, in trying to examine that. Also, the textbook does an inadequate job of this. There's far better ways of doing this that we look at in 4C3. So uh, this is not something I want to cover in the exam. Chapter 8 then is um, the, in, that's in the newer version, and in the old version, chapter 6. This introduces the topic of multiple reactions. Okay, and uh, some of the, the key points over here that we looked at was selectivity, yield. Introduce those two concepts. And the main other point of this chapter was to modify our plan. Okay, so when I talk about the plan here, the plan was the strategy we used to solve these problems, which we had a very comprehensive flow chart handed out. We then said, well, let's modify that plan. I'm not going to write up the modification here. We looked at it several times in the class. But you'll recall that what the plan required is we write out the mole balance for every species and we write out the reaction rates for every reaction. Okay, so we had to do two parts, mole balances for every species, reaction rates for every reaction, and then we summed them up. And we did that as well in the course project. So you've had ample, ample experience doing this and in the class in chapter 8 we did about two, two or three examples of that. So there's really no need to write on that plan again. But the key point was here, when we're dealing with multiple reactions, the key point is use CJ. So use the concentrations. You do not use X for conversion. So 
So that's, uh, we've emphasized that now several times. Recently, for the past two weeks or so, we've been looking at temperature effects. And because we covered it so recently, I won't go into a whole lot of depth, other than to simply recall the fact that what, what I mean by that is the temperature effects introduce a new equation, dt by dv equals something, or dt by dw. Again, you're very good at this expression because you've done this in the course project and coded that up. So you're very comfortable with that now. And that is an additional ODE. To model temperature. Okay, so now we're taking away that isothermal assumption. So really in chapter 11 and 12, or chapter 8 in the older version of the book, you're at the most general type of reactor design. You've got multiple reactions occurring with temperature changes happening and pressure changes. Okay, so what this re requires is, if we take away that isothermal assumption, it means that we need to bring in a new equation to handle temperature change, and that's this additional ODE. So ODEs are required because now we've got a non-adiabatic we're adding and removing heat through a heat exchanger or uh, through the reactor. We've got heat transfer occurring, so it's not adiabatic. And that we've got a temperature profile. Okay, so that's what the ODE is. In all other cases, we don't need an ODE. We simply get an algebraic equation. So we derive in Quite a bit of detail, the enthalpy balance around a reactor, particularly with STRs. And for those cases, so for other cases, so what I mean by other cases is well, for the case of non adiabatic and temperature profiles, so in other words, this is for PFRs, both for reactors. So for all other cases, we end up with an algebraic equation. And that algebraic equation, let's make a careful note here, after several simplifications, that algebraic equation looks something, or looks as follows. It's Q dot minus the flow in times this heat capacity term CP naught. Temperature minus the inlet temperature minus the heat generated in the reaction multiplied by FA naught X. And that's set to zero. And we, we emphasize that that equation, while it's, it's got several terms in it that make it up, it really is a simple statement of the enthalpy and energy in the system. Those first two terms refer to the heat. We call that G of T. Sorry, sorry, not G of T, R of T. This is the heat removed due to... Uh, Due to, due to external heating effects, so if we've got cooling or uh, external heat transfer occurring, that's going to remove some of the heat out of the system. Or this term over here refers to enthalpy flows adding or removing heat. So while we call this the removal term, R of T, if it's negative, it implies we're adding heat. If it's positive, it is implying that we're removing heat. Um, so that's that term, and then plus, G of T, this is the generated term. So 
So taking into account this negative sign and lumping that into G, we've got what's removed plus what's generated must net out to zero if we're operating in steady state. So the, the key is if at steady state. Okay. This entire course, except for batch reactors, has always assumed steady state. So we've never looked at unsteady state operation at CSTRs. I really wish we had an extra two weeks or so to look at that because that is true for many systems is that they never operate at steady state. As you will quickly realize when you start working, the steady state assumption is almost always false. So that's just what it is though. We don't really consider in this course time for unsteady state jet balances. But as long as we are at steady state or close to it, we can make this assumption that whatever is removed plus what's generated must net out to zero. that we derived an E of T function, which we called yesterday uh, the exit, sorry, Monday night's class, we called it the exit age distribution, which is a good description of what it does. It tells me what fraction of material leaves at certain time points. So it's the distribution of the ages of the material as they're exiting the reactor. And we use that to tell how non-ideal our system is relative to the ideal curves. So in the last class we derived the ideal curves E of T for CSTRs and for plug flow reactors. Okay? And then we can superimpose our actual residence time distribution function E of T to see how non-ideal we are. Okay, so that's a good a good analysis that we often do in practice because it gives us some insight into where our system is behaving as non-ideal and then we can make modifications to our reactors to, to get them to behave more ideally. So, so exit age distribution functions are widely used by companies in order to better in, improve their conversion and improve the yields from the reactors. So in, a, in about 45 minutes, we've reviewed 13 weeks of substantial body of work. Um, there's, there's a lot covered here. Okay, so in, in some of the other courses, we've had missed classes. For this course, we've not missed a single class, and we've had uh, 45 to 50 minute classes every single time. We've covered a lot of ground. Okay, so this snapshot that I've given you here by no means emphasizes important or non-important parts, it simply just emphasizes what we covered and puts it into context for you. Um, in terms of the final exam, I've posted everything I can reveal about the final exam on the course website. So I think it's 93 marks, three hours, uh, it's the Saturday afternoon. One important point is, unfortunately, the university has scheduled it on Saturday. I am not able to be there on Saturday. And that's not a big problem. Most instructors don't come to their final exams. I typically do try to, but I'm unable to make it to the Saturday's exam. What the key assumption is, and it's written on the exam script, is if there's anything that's unclear, you make a reasonable assumption to work with it. And that's on all my exams that I ever set. Okay, so, so that's an important point there, there should not be anything, however, that's quite unclear in the exam. Um, I've looked at it several times, I believe it to be fairly, fairly clearly written. However, should there be something that you don't quite understand, uh, please 
please follow that guidance over there. The other guidance that I strongly suggest you follow is the idea of working with a systematic plan and strategy. Do not simply take down the material that's in the exam and plug it into the first equation that you find appropriate. Uh, think about your strategy that's, that's suitable for that question and work through the define step, work through the explore step, and then also not just uh, the, the plan and the do it step, but also then the checking step. That's one step that people often omit to, to do, is to check the results to make sure it's reasonable. Okay, so we looked at that flow of work in many classes now and for many examples, so it should be something that you're comfortable with. But um, again, I, I can't emphasize that strongly enough is to use the system Any other questions? Are there some practice problems for this last chapter that you posted? That oh, good question. Yes. Um, all the chapters now, I've updated the website to have three or four practice problems that really reflect the types of questions I will be asking in the exam, and also the types of, of cover the concepts that I expect you to understand. Um, it's 93 marks, 3 hours, uh, I'm not sure what else. How many questions? Does it make a difference if I say 50? Thank you.